All right, and we are live. Let's do a quick sound right. check, and we are live. Yeah, I can hear your echo, even if I'm not on the website. Let's do a quick sound check, and we are live. Yeah, I can hear your echo, even if I'm not on the website. <laughs> Five seconds lag. I guess it's fine. Yeah, I think it's okay. I think um somewhere uh that's where I am. <laughs> it's good. I had it open at least three times. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see if the comments section, yeah. The chat is open. Yeah, I can see the comments. Okay. <laughs> wow, people are already commenting. Thank you. All right, yeah. We can hear the echo. Very good. How is the echo now? I hope it has disappeared. I don't so have any echo a bit of latency, side. just saying. Uh, all right. Yeah. It is 7 p.m. Are you ready? I think, uh, I think we're good. Okay, sound seems uh, okay. Then, uh, all right, let's start. So um, thanks everyone for uh, joining us. This is uh, always fun to have you. I guess most of you are at home. Um, yeah, I'm glad we have uh, each other online to keep chatting about science and stuff. Um, so I should introduce a little bit uh, maybe uh, this event and, um, and Cross Labs, which uh, is the, this new institute that is organizing these uh, crossroads uh, events. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, so Cross Labs is a, a one-year-old uh, research institute. Uh, we focus on um, all intelligent sciences and uh, new crazy technologies that can come out of it. Um, so we believe in doing things uh, differently from uh, from academia. So um, while uh, uh, doing uh, fundamental research, we also uh, focus on uh, being very um, AI industry also oriented, uh, which is helped by, by us being connected with uh, an AI company called Cross Compass. So um, what we do is uh, we distill knowledge about well, mind, brain science, mathematics, uh, information theory, uh, AI neural nets, uh, you know, all the stuff uh, we all like. And uh, yeah, we want to bring this to new technologies and change society. So these, uh, these Crossroads events are monthly events. Uh, the date kind of changes depending on the uh, speaker availability. Um, so we focus on sciences of mind uh, and intelligence and, um, and these are sponsored by uh, by Cross Compass, the AI company. So, so it's a it's a company focusing on well, all tech, for mostly AI, IoT, manufacturing AI, vision, uh, robotics, uh, a lot of things. Um, and uh, yeah, I want to thank before I forget uh, everyone at Cross Compass who's helping to organize these. Uh, so, uh, Antoine Pasquali, Katsunobu Suzuki, our CEO, uh, Stephen Way, and special thanks to uh, Yasmin Morel as well who has been helping and many other. Uh, people around this that you don't see, but who might be in the chat. Uh, okay, and um, tonight we have a very special guest, uh, Lena Sinatea, welcome. Uh, she is an associate researcher at Sony CSL, um, now uh, moving uh, in Kyoto. So we have a Sony CSL Kyoto, very lucky, right next door to, to here, so we're neighbors. Um, and Lana is an artificial life researcher. Uh, she builds systems to better understand them, I'm quoting her website, um, and especially um, what I would say is a predictive um, cognitive systems, I guess. Uh, so for example, she builds neural networks. I think she's going to share something special about it uh, tonight. Um, but also she works a lot to make um, the standards of science, especially publishing and uh, disseminating uh, research, uh, those kind of standards that are well, uh, pretty uh, debatable in science. Um, and uh, she's also uh, the A-Life Research Chair and curates uh, A-Life papers on Twitter. 
so tonight she's going to present a four giraffe birthday cake, uh, generating visual illusions with neural networks. And the event is uh, going to be in uh, three parts. So um, first we start with the talk, of course, like uh, 30 minutes or so. And uh, so we're trying something new. Um, so you can actually interrupt with comments or questions. Uh, and uh, Lena is going to, uh, to, 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 to show that maybe, or uh, you, you can see a link in the description if you reload the page uh, at the top of the YouTube description. Uh, you can see that we are using comment screen. I also posted that uh, in, the, in the chat on YouTube. Um, so you can, yeah, just feel free to comment anything. Uh, if you have questions, it's, it's as close as we can go to, to, uh, uh, to being in the same room. Uh, so after the talk, second part is uh, we have an open-ended discussion as always, and we'll use Slido for that part. I'll post the link during the talk in the chat. Okay, and then after that, we'll disconnect from YouTube and have our private uh, little chat, always fun, you can have a drink and everything. Okay, so uh, maybe I'll disappear for now. Lana, are you still there? I'm here and I'm going to share my screen. So I think you maybe. should stop yeah. sharing yours if you're sharing it. And yeah, I'm, I'm not, yeah, I hope I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah. I'm going to share, right. Can you see my screen? I can, can everyone? Okay. Yep. So first, okay. let's talk about this uh, comment screen function. So if you go, as Olaf said, uh, uh, in the description below the YouTube video, you will find a link. And if you click on the link, you can access this page. And what happens if you type something like hi and send, it will happen, it will appear on my screen. So I can see your questions and your, um, your reactions. So you can send little thumbs up, so please use that if you have questions during the talk. Right, thank you. <laughs> so let me first explain the title of this talk because it's a very strange title. So this was on the left, you can see what was the first illusion that my network generated, right? At least the first that worked. And I'm going to, yeah, okay. And what I did, I took this image and I sent it on Twitter. And I asked people to use any kind of AI that they wanted to generate a title for this illusion. And the winner was this bot that generates captions from pictures. And the bot said, this is a close up of a birthday cake with candles. And then Janel Shane asked, uh, how many giraffes are on the cake? and the bot said four. So the title of this illusion, the first motion illusion to be ever generated by uh, a machine is four giraffe birthday cake. So I'm going to uh, introduce myself. So Olaf already said a lot of <laughs> uh, information about me. So my name is Lana. I'm an artificial life scientist who also does AI stuff. If you don't know what artificial life is, I wrote an introduction for the gradient. So you can either uh, screenshot this QR code or you can just Google the title, which is introduction to artificial life for people who like AI. And I'm a researcher in Kyoto. And by the way, uh, Sony Computer Science, Science Labs in Kyoto is currently hiring. So if you are interested in working with us, please, just Google the name and you will find our recruitment page. So today I'm going to be talking about several things. I'm going to talk about artificial perception, about what are illusions, are they bad? And I'm going to talk a lot about failure. Let me start with an example. So imagine you built a calculator and you programmed it and my job is to replicate your program, but I cannot open the calculator to see what is inside. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give your program inputs and look at the outputs. So for example, I give the calculator five plus four and the calculator says the answer is nine. So that's a success. This is the right answer. 
So I'm going to try to replicate this right answer. But the issue is there are many different ways to obtain this answer, even if it's just four plus five. So there are maybe a million different ways to get nine. And just because I get the same answer as your calculator, it doesn't mean that I calculated the same ways, way as you did. So a different thing that I could do is instead try to make your program fail. For example, I give it 16 plus 16 and your calculator says the answer is minus 16. So that's a wrong answer, that's a failure. But to me, it's a really big win because it tells me a lot about your program. In this case, it tells me that your program is using a very small memory. So if what I'm trying to do is to do, make a program that is like yours, I should probably also use a very small memory. Now, what AI is doing at the moment is this. We take a task that we think humans are good at, for example, playing games or recognizing images. And then we try to build a machine that can do the same thing. And we work a lot for years. And if we are lucky, we get uh, a little bit successful. And then suddenly we are very successful. We have very good results. Just because we have good results, good performance, doesn't mean that we understand what is happening in the human brain or in other types of brains. So I think it's very important to make a difference between what, how to frame your project. So if you are trying to get good performance, get good numbers on a task, you should be very clear about that. So that if you, you get um, good performance, people cannot complain and say, this is not how humans do it. You know, you can say you don't care. Your goal is just to have very good performance. And on the other side, if what you're doing, to, what you're trying to do is trying to increase knowledge, so trying to understand how systems work, you should also be clear about that. And you should be allowed to say that you don't have uh, maybe a good performance on the benchmark, but you think what you're doing is interesting. And of course, both of these things go together. They are interdependent but they shouldn't be confused. So when you see headlines like this one, uh, AI beats humans at games, art, law, and everything, or computers are, are better than humans at recognizing images, there are two things you should think about. The first is what is really the goal here? And the second th thing is how you define better when you say that an AI is better than a human. Here is an example of an image where if I ask you what is the description of this image, what is the label, the AI will beat you 100% of the time. So what do you think is the label for this image? You can type it into the comment screen. Anyone has a guess? How you describe this image with just one word or two words? I'm not even sure people can hear me. Are you there? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, you can hear. So elections. Yeah, maybe it looks like elections. It looks like people are inside the building. They are doing something. Maybe it's a factory. Maybe it's a kind of contest. Right, it looks like it, they are judging something tasting, maybe. They look very focused on something, maybe a plate. So the correct label for this is hamster. The correct answer given by the image recognition algorithm is hamster. You would never guess that. Does it mean that the AI is better than you at recognizing the image? I'm not sure. I mean, probably not. We have to compare things that are comparable. We not compare, say, a plane and a, a bird. You know, one goes very fast, the other one is maybe not always so fast. One uses a lot of fuel, the other one just uses seeds. You know, it's fine to compare things if the comparison makes sense. There are other examples of labels. So the word in black is what the human would say, and the correct answer is in red. So if you say that the first picture is a missile, you're wrong. The correct answer is projectile. This is very unnatural, but this is the right answer in this case. 
<laughs> yeah, it's strange. So this is what I'm trying to make happen. Let's build artificial perception based on this philosophy. First, we, we must recognize that there are many ways to mimic success and there are fewer ways to mimic a failure. Therefore, we could say that failures can be more informative than successes. So let's focus on failures. And the last thing is we have to build it to understand it. This is um, a principle that is very central to artificial life. If you can try to build it, you will probably understand more about the system. So let's build artificial systems to investigate and recreate perceptual failures. So that's why I'm so interested in visual illusions because they are often considered to be a failure of your visual system. What does it mean to be right? That's the, the good question. When I say this AI is better than a human, what do I really mean? That's, that's the, the problem with, with benchmarks. It depends what, what you're trying to do. If you're trying to build a product, and the product has to have this kind of labels and say projectile instead of missile, then the right answer would be projectile. So here are some examples of visual illusions. Uh, the, sometimes you see a motion when there is no motion or you see things that don't exist, you see shapes that aren't there. And if you look up the definition of illusion in the dictionary, the dictionary says, an illusion is a wrong or misinterpreted perception of a sensory experience. Below that, I wrote some other definitions that I think maybe are more interesting. So an illusion is an unexpected interpretation of an ambiguous stimulus, or it's a conflict between your perception and your knowledge. You know that this image is not moving, but you see a motion or it's a side effect of your brain being too good at something. And I will talk about this a little bit more later. Now I'm especially interested in motion illusions for several reasons. First reason is it's not only humans that can see these kind of illusions. Cats, cats react to motion illusions and also fish and even bees can see some kinds of illusions. So it means that it must be a very basic property of visual systems because these animals, including humans, are very far from each other from an evolutionary point of view. This is an article that was published in the MIT Tech Review two years ago. So they say, neural networks don't understand what optical illusions are. Researchers have discovered that the systems cannot recognize optical illusions, which means they also can't create new ones. So it was two years ago and AI research moves quite fast. So now everything that is written here is already wrong. So we have systems that can recognize illusions and now we also have a network that can build new visual illusions. But the most interesting thing that the MIT forgot to say about illusions is that humans also don't understand visual illusions. We don't know why they work, how they work, where they come from. There are a lot of different hypotheses about you know, how they work, where, where are they processed in your brain, what is the cause of illusions, but there is no consensus about what is the real reason. So it's not just neural networks that don't understand optical illusions. So here are some examples of illusions generated by my neural network, which is called Eigen for evolutionary illusion, illusion generator. If you can see any kind of motion, please send maybe a thumbs up. And if you cannot see anything, send a little heart. I would like to know if you can see something. So personally, I can see some motion, so I will send a little sound up like this. Okay, so some people can see something, maybe four people. <laughs> so when I asked on Twitter what people see, on the left, they see the circles um, shrinking 
and on the right, they see a rotation. Now, it's not everyone that can see visual illusions. If you have a really, really good illusion, maybe 50% of people will be able to see it. If you have a normal kind of illusion that is not too strong, then maybe 25% of people can see it. And this kind of illusion, the percentage of people on Twitter <laughs> who can see it is about 20, 25%. So here is another, another example of rotating illusions. Now I'm going to explain how I got there. For me, the story started with this paper in uh, 2017, so three years ago. There was a paper published where there was a team of people who built a convolutional neural network and trained it to predict videos. So you give it some images, some frames from the video, and you train it to predict the next frame. And they trained it and they found, oh, this network has a really high performance. The predictions are really good. And if you look here, uh, between the actual input and the prediction, there is almost no difference. It's a really high performance network. Now, what was interesting for me about this is that that network was built on the principles of predictive coding. Predictive coding says that your brain is always trying to predict the world. So what comes from your eyes and your ears and all your senses, your brain is always trying to predict that. And to do so, it's, um, first it decomposes the stimulus in a hierarchical way, and it tries to minimize the error on its own predictions. So predictive coding says several things about how this should be done. It hasn't been demonstrated in the brain, but the interesting thing is that when they built a neural network based on these principles, then they found that the network had a very, very good performance. And then one year after that, there was another paper. So spoiler, now I'm a collaborator of the first author, but at the time I, I didn't know them, I just, saw the paper and thought it was really interesting. So the paper said, illusory motion reproduced by deep neural networks trained for predictions. What is interesting about this claim is that until then, most of the hypotheses about motion illusions were based on the idea that it came from a, some kind of anatomical uh, characteristic. For example, the way your sensors are distributed on your retina or the way your eyes move in an unconscious way. But that team, they showed that if you use the network that I talked about and you train it on a video. So in this case, they used a video of some guy going to Disneyland. So just a normal guy doing normal things and you train the network on this video and then you show it an illusion network will predict that the illusion is moving. So the interesting thing is that this network was not trained on illusions. It was just trained on, trained on normal videos of normal people. And then when you show it this illusion for the first time, so this illusion is called the rotating snake illusion, then the network predict that this should be moving. The way you know that is you give the network this image maybe 10 times or 20 times or 50 times. So just give it the same image again and again. What would normally happen if you do that, say with a picture of a face, is that the network gets used to it and the network knows that this image shouldn't be moving. It hasn't been moving for the last 50 frames. So it's not going to start moving now. But when you give it the illusion and you do the same thing, you give it the same illusion for 50 times, the network still predicts that this should be moving so when you calculate the difference between the input and the prediction, you find that to the transformation between the two images is a slight rotation. So it means that the network is sensitive to visual illusions, or at least to motion illusions. Now, another very interesting experiment that they did is they didn't only test it on good visual illusions. They also gave it this image. So on the 
right, you have a broken illusion. If you swap some of the colors, then the illusion stops moving for humans. On the left, you have the working illusion. On the right, you have the broken illusion. And if you give that to the network, it stops predicting motion. So it's sensitive to the same type of illusion as humans. It's not just randomly predicting stuff. So that kind of flew into the face of the existing hypothesis because the neural network doesn't have eyes, it doesn't have eye motion, it, it doesn't have a special repartition of sensors or anything, it's just trying to predict videos. Now, when I read this paper, I thought it was very exciting and interesting, but I still had some questions left. The most important question was why? You know, why is this happening? We still don't know why. What is, what, what is it about the video of a guy going to Disneyland that makes you see visual illusions? I don't see the, the, the link here. So I sent the author an email about something different <laughs> And we talked about this and we started working together to find why. Now, the reason why I was interested in this paper is that my own work is mostly about prediction. Prediction in AI, prediction in artificial life, using prediction to find life on other planets. I'm really just interested in prediction. And according to artificial life principles, if you want to understand it, you have to build it. And I started building uh, by hand new visual illusions. And by the way, humans are not the only one who understand or who at least are able to build illusions. There are some birds who take rocks and kind of organize them in a way that it make, makes a visual illusion if you look at it from the front. And the male birds do that. And if their illusion is really good, they have a higher success with the lady birds. So I thought, instead of building this by myself, I'm going to try to train a network to generate these new illusions. And my, thought, my first thought was, you know, how hard can it be? Now we have a network that can see illusions, so the rest should be easy, right? And I'm not the only person who thought that because just after the paper was published, several people tried to generate new illusions. And it turns out it's actually pretty hard. This was one of my first results. So what I did is I generate random images. Then I give these images to the trained predictive network and I look at the motion vectors and I take the image that has the biggest motion vectors. I modify this image a little bit and then I send this new batch of images to the train network and you just repeat this. So it's, a, it's an evolutionary algorithm. And when I look at this result, there are at least three big problems. The first problem is it's not working. Nothing is moving here. It's just not working. The second issue is it's kind of ugly. I mean, it's really not appealing. It's not art. <laughs> And the last problem is this uh, idea of how do you tell the network what is a good illusion, and what is not a good illusion? Because if you just say, just give me big motion vectors, what you're doing is you're optimizing for errors. Network is failing. Network is saying something is moving while it's not moving. So it's failing and you're telling it, please fail harder, fail harder. So of course, if you do that, you will just get a bunch, a bunch of random noise. It's not going to work. We have to fix at least these three issues. First, it's dirty, it's not beautiful. Second, what kind of loss function is good? And lastly, it doesn't move. How do I make this move? So to solve the issue of the beauty of the image, I used compositional pattern producing networks. I'm not going to explain exactly how it works, but David Ha has a really nice blog post about this that I used where he explains uh, how it works. But basically, if you simplify a lot, it's like this. You give the network some kind of structure about the image. You tell, you tell it 
some basic information. And then the network gets creative and you get a beautiful image. Very simplified. So that solved the problem of the ugliness of the images. If you use CPPNs, you get images that are quite uh, aesthetic. So about, about the other issues, the first thing I did is I changed the evolution model. So I used something called NEAT, which is very convenient because now that, now that my um, image generating network is a network, I can use NEAT, which is used for evolving networks. Somebody is asking, uh, what did I use first to generate images? I don't exactly remember, but it was a mix of pure random noise to so change some random pixels and um, mating images. So if you have two images that are good, try to mix them in one way or another. Of course, that's not how you really want to evolve images, but <laughs> I had no experience in generating images. That was my naive first try. So after that, I started using NEAT. NEAT is an algorithm that uh, does two things. The first is it evolves neural networks. The networks start very simple, and then they get more and more complex. And the second thing is that NEAT values diversity. So instead of taking just the best image and try to modify that, NEAT will take the networks and divide them into species and keep the species that are most different from each other. So you keep as much diversity as you can, and then you take the best network of each species. The good thing here is that if you don't know what is the right way to get the right answer, then you should, you should keep your options open. Just accept all solutions, solutions that are innovative, basically. You can read more about the philosophy of NEAT by reading Ken Stanley's book or by listening to his talk. So the book is called Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned. And it's a really good book, even if you're not a scientist. It's just a very interesting book. And the last and most important issue, what will I use for cost function? So if I just say, give me a big vector, that doesn't work. Let's compare one of the first uh, results that I got on the left and what I'm going for on the right. The first obvious difference is that on the right, you have some kind of structure. The vectors are kind of going in the same direction. So I could tell that to the network. I could say, give me vectors that are kind of aligned. Then you get this. So it's a bit better. It's still not moving, but you can feel something. <laughs> The second big difference is, well, the, the, the vectors are aligned, but they're not exactly the same. They change a little bit with the angle. So you need, you need a mix of diversity and structure. So you can tell that to the network. Give me some vectors that are on the same direction and some that are not, and you get this, and it's already better. Personally, for me, this illusion of on the right, bottom right, it moves a little bit. Can anyone see it moving? It's not very strong, it's, but it's better than before. And of course, what you can really do is use circles, circles because they have a structure and at the same time, it's easy to make the vectors change just with the angle on the circle. So if you tell the network to give you circles with, net, with um, vectors that are kind of aligned, you can get this kind of result. The first one is a shrinking illusion. So all of the vectors, the motion vectors are going towards the center, but they are at different angles. The second one is a rotating illusion, like the rotating snake illusion. And another trick that you can use is copy paste the same illusion several times and flip it and put it on the same page. So what's happening here is that by doing that, you increase the confusion of your brain. You increase the order 
you increase the structure, and at the same time, you also increase the number of vectors that um, disagree with each other. You can also try having, uh, how do you say, uh, horizontal bands. For me, they don't work very well, but when I asked on Twitter, for example, the one in the middle is about the same strength as this one. For me, the circles work better, but you know it depends on people and the network says that this also works. So <laughs> if people and network say that it works, then I believe it. So this is the answer of the question. How do you generate new visual illusions with a network? First, you train a network to predict videos, normal videos. Then when it becomes able to detect motion illusions, you can use it as a way to, um, as ways to judge the images that are generated by a different network. Then you give it the right loss function, and now you can enjoy your illusion generator which will generate new patterns every time in an unpredictable way. So what do we learn from this? Oh, yes, I forgot to say. You can play with the code on uh, GitHub. So this is the link, but if you just look for my name and GitHub, you should find the repository. Um, it runs on Colab. So even if you don't have any kind of fancy hardware, you can still play with it. So what we learn from this is that if you agree with the uh, definition of the MIT, which I don't, you can now say that artificial neural networks do understand what illusions are. I don't think that's true, but you could say that. And the second thing that we learn is that illusions, I mean, we have more evidence now that illusions come from trying to predict the world because it's not enough to ju just take some uh, illusions that already exist and show it to the network and the network says, okay, yes, that's an illusion. Now, now we can do the opposite too. We can make the network create an illusion, ask humans, does this work? Is this moving? And if they say yes, then it's a uh, pretty strong evidence that what the network is doing and what the human is doing has some, some kind of overlap. And the only thing that the network is doing is predicting stuff. So the last very interesting result that I got was this. This is a famous illusion called the Fraser-Wilcox illusion. Uh, it's an illusion that was published in Nature in 79. So in 79, you could get a Nature paper from building a new illusion. About 50% of people see some kind of motion in this kind, this type of illusion. And I again actually managed to kind of rediscover this illusion from scratch. So this blue illusion was generated by the network and it has the same um, pattern of contrast going from dark to light. And it also predicts the same kind of illusory motion. So I think this is a pretty good uh, replication of this illusion. Then there is this. So this doesn't work for me, but um, on the left, you have a very famous illusion that is used a lot in research to study visual illusions. It's called the Enigma. And I think you're supposed to see some kind of shrinking motion or uh, growing motion. And on the right, you have some illusions that were generated by Eigen. And although it's not a replication because clearly there are some big differences, what I find interesting is that when the network generates an illusion that is supposed to shrink or expand, it will often use the same kind of colors like purples and pink and some black and white. So it's not, it's not statistical, it's not hard data, but it's still kind of interesting. So what did I learn from doing this, except from fundamental facts about illusions? The first thing is that, well, it's true that if you try to build something, you will understand it better. Because before doing this project, I was working on the link between prediction and illusion. 
and I thought, I thought I kind of understood most of what there was to understand. You know, I had some ideas, some hypotheses, some experiments that worked. And then when I started trying to make this network generate illusion, illusions, I learned many things that I just didn't know. So there's still a lot that I don't know, I expect, but trying to build the system really helped me learn new things. The second thing that I learned is that your brain is really trying its best. So it may show you stuff that doesn't exist. Maybe you see emotion and there is no motion, but this is just because your brain is really, really good at doing something else. It's really good at predicting the world. So if you don't see any kind of illusion at all, there are chances that you're also missing stuff that happens in the real world. I'm going to end with this slide. So for me, the next thing is working on color illusions. And these are topics you could be working on because there is a lot of area that is not covered. So color illusions, change blindness, illusory contours. And if you have any other examples of failures, I'm interested. So I'm ending with a question for you. Do you have other examples of failures? And you can now, if you have questions for me, you can now ask your questions. Thank you for listening. Awesome. Thank you, Lana. So uh, yeah, we can we cannot clap, of course, because we're, we're not all on Zoom. But uh, but I guess we can uh, uh, we can do thumbs up or. Uh, <laughs> um, all right. So uh, we are entering the uh, discussion part. Yay! So what I'm going to do is um, uh, first I'm going to send you, Lana, in the YouTube chat with works as well. The present present mode link for uh, Slido. Which we uh, use can you can you send it through Zoom instead of uh, YouTube? Because if I open YouTube, yeah, sure. the sound will be weird. Yeah, that's a good point. So here you go. Thank Got it? you. Okay. And for everyone else, I'm going to post uh, again the the link uh, for uh, Slido, which is our question answer uh, thingy. You will see it appear on uh, Lena's screen pretty soon. And uh, let's see here. So should, should I continue sharing my screen to show the slide? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, this way I can uh, I can All moderate. Right. Yeah. So I will share this and share. Right. Okay. The first question is: Do networks show the same viability in susceptibility detection as humans? So uh, Yes. Maybe before, yeah, let, let me just say, like, also, if anyone wants to join um, uh, on Zoom, that's also okay. So I have to uh, ping you in. So please uh, make sure you, uh, you log in with, the, with a name that I recognize from the list of participants. And same on, if you want to ask the, Zoom, the, the question that you asked on Slido, then please also not post anonymously, anonymously, uh, on Slido either. If you log in, that would be helpful. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, let's. Yes. Uh, let's. <laughs> so the first question is a very interesting question. Viability in neural networks. Um, yes, we have a lot of viability and it mostly depends on the kind of data that you're giving the network. So for example, we found that if you, if you train the network on a video where there is no sun and no light, not, no good lighting, the network will not learn to see visual illusions, for example. Or if you train it on videos that don't have a lot of motion, then it also, it becomes very good at predicting these videos, but not so good at predict, predicting motion. So we can kind of guess a little bit what could happen in humans, but I haven't really checked with actual human data, so I cannot say if it's the same viability, but there is some viability. Okay, so that's one. There are a few more questions. I'm going to highlight a, a random one from the list, if that's okay. Uh, but, but people can vote, so I think 
should yeah and people to... can vote so for now it's yeah. it's random it, but if you vote you'll you'll go up <laughs> first yeah okay right. so do i choose a question they are both the same number of words uh then uh, then pick the top one okay so a question from kai what thoughts do you have for predictive networks for non-motion visual illusions? Also a good question. Um, so there is some work about how prediction could cause some other uh, types of illusions. For example, illusions where you you see a shape, a shape, but there is no shape there. Uh, I don't know if you see what I mean. I can, I can show it. I have, a, I have it somewhere here. Right. So this illusion on the right, you can see a shape. You can see a triangle, but there is no triangle. So this seems to also be related to prediction. And of course you also have um, prediction causing illusions in other areas than vision. In uh, uh, auditive, auditory illusions are very famous and a lot of them are caused by prediction too. And then there are some illusions that seem to be caused by uh, things that have nothing to do with uh, prediction. For example, that one with the grid with the black dots that appear everywhere, it's not for sure, but it looks like it's maybe not linked to prediction. And also color illusions seems to be, seem to be caused by prediction. <laughs> Second high voted question, are illusions of motion the only illusions that would depend on predictive mechanism. So I think I answered to that part. And the other part of the question is what other mechanism may be responsible for other illusions? Well, before we started talking about prediction, a lot of the hypotheses were about the way your sensors are distributed on your eye or some kind of uh, processing, processing that your eye does before your brain. So, I mean, we have to be kind of careful about this because um, it's possible. It's one possible explanation, but it takes more than that to convince me. <laughs> I would like to see this, this hypothesis make new predictions. So for example, say that you think uh, some kind of illusion is due to the fact that your eyes are moving a certain way, then please build a new illusion that shows <laughs> that your hypothesis could be right. That's how, that's what it takes to convince me at least. The next question also interesting. So uh, Jan says, it's interesting that symmetrical, especially radial images do not create symmetrical patterns of vectors. Have you looked into why this happens? Yes, so let me show what you mean. You mean uh, it's uh, yeah. So this is a good example. So here at the bottom, you can see that. Oops, sorry. <laughs> you can see that on the left you have very strong motion vectors, and on the right they are not so strong. I think. This is due mostly to the fact, to, to the way the network is trained. So some things that happen in the video on the left side don't necessarily happen on the right side. So some sides might be favored. And if we had maybe more images or more balanced data set, that might not happen. And the other thing is actually, if you, depending on the way you calculate these motion vectors, which is also another big issue. Depending on the way you calculate it, you can get more symmetrical patterns like this one. This is way more symmetrical than what I did. And basically to get this, you have to 
let the network think for a longer time. So say you give it the image for 40 frames and then you stop and you ask it to predict for 20 more frames, for example. The image that I'm showing, I just asked the network to predict for two more frames. So it's not yet very sure that this is rotating maybe. Next question. Can the current method be applied to geometric illusions such as the Muller layer illusion? So I have to look this one up right now because <laughs> I'm not sure which one it is. Oh, I think, I think there is a paper with neural networks and this illusion, but I'm not really sure, I can't remember but I think, so I think the official explanation for this one, at least in humans, is that it's an effect of perspective. So you see these shapes as, not that, as 2D lines, but as 3D shapes. And based on that, you infer the length of the lines. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there is a paper using neural networks doing that, but sorry, I don't really remember the title or what they said exactly. Do you have a, an intuition on how difficult it would be to generate those ones versus the other one? Uh, these ones are kind of easy because we know why they happen. <laughs> so it's not, they are not hard to generate, but uh, they're, they're also a bit boring. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can make many different lines of different lines, right? <laughs> <laughs> I see. Next question. I wish I knew the answer to this question. So I will read it. Can you talk a little bit more about animals and illusions? What are the simplest animals that have been seen to react to illusions? Are there any big animals that do not? So I think there should be more research about that, but AI people especially are very biased towards humans. A lot of people are only interested in human intelligence and they don't really care about, say, the visual system of the cat or a worm or an insect. And it's very sad. It's, it's you know, it would be, be very interesting to know, can a worm see an illusion? Maybe it's hard to set up an experiment, but we should at least try, I think. I think for more of, in the papers that I saw, the simplest, simplest, it's hard to define, but the smallest animal that so that can see illusions is uh, the honeybee. So that's what I know. Any big animals that do not, uh, I don't know because there are no experiments. That's interesting. Does it come from uh, Does it come from the honeybee being highly able to, well, uh, yeah, at vision tasks? Honeybees are very good at vision tasks. Not only they can see illusions, but they can also learn uh, different the meanings of different colors. They can count. They can count fractional numbers. They are very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess it uh, it helps to uh, to uh, to orient yourself to recognize landscape around you. I think ants also. So there were some studies about that. Yeah, and bees they fly really fast, so they should be really good at predicting motion, I guess. Yeah, but how does that help if, in, uh, you know, what's the intersection between that and, uh, and trying to uh, uh, recognize some sets of faces? Classifying faces is, seems very different from, you know, like recognizing where you are. Now that you say that, um, wasps, they can recognize faces of other wasps. <laughs> Uh, and it has nothing to do with your question, but I think it's interesting. That's <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Yeah. So I guess so social animals is, uh, is, is your bet? Uh, I think if you could set up experiments, you would find that most animals that have a visual system are sensitive to illusions. And those don't, that don't have a visual systems are sensitive to other types of illusions. Hmm. <sighs> I know close to nothing about this, but it sounds super interesting. Thank you, Klaus, for the question. <laughs> uh, all right. 
Okay, next question oh, is, um, ah. do other predictive neural networks rather than PredNet also understand the motion illusion? So that's something that we, we, we will be testing soon. Um, we haven't tested it yet, but my guess is if it's based on the same architecture as what predictive coding says, it should be able to learn to, yeah, to learn from a normal vid video and be able to see illusions. It's just a guess. I don't have data, but it's my guess. You know, I don't see why not. It was the first network that we tried and it worked. So <laughs> why not mm. something else? Isn't perception in general an illusion in itself? That depends on your definition of illusion. So if you mean, if your question is whether perception is always vertical or not, so do we always see the world as it is or not? And clearly we don't. So you could say that perception in general is an illusion. But if you mean illusion as is, as in uh, say, a conflict between what you know and what you perceive, then not all perception is an illusion, right? Yeah, I think Antoine will probably join soon the, on Zoom to, to debate about that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. The next question is for, from Alberto. Hi, Alberto, I hope you're doing well. Uh, thank you. So is it really correct to consider illusion like Canisa's triangle, like failures? Um, in some ways, yes, and also no. So the fact that illusions are so common mean, means that there's a chance that they, they serve a purpose, they are useful for something. In that sense, they're not really failures. But in another sense, you're seeing something, something that you're not expecting to see. If I show you the motion illusion, illusion, it's not really moving, but your brain is saying this is moving. So in a sense, in that sense, it's a failure. Should I read the next question? Yep. I think we lost Olaf. Oh, okay, you're here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what about failures outside the human visual, visual spectrum? Uh, for example, bees can see in ultraviolet. Could they be tricked into illusory perception? Yeah, I don't see why not. There is no reason why it would be limited to the visible spectrum or even just to vision. So yeah, that's a cool question. Um, I'm also curious if, I mean, humans cannot perceive <laughs> ultraviolet, but would we feel some kind of uneasiness in front of an ultraviolet uh, illusion? Maybe. And the last question, is it a continuous change that may or may not cause the illusion? At this time, there were people whose figures moved and people who didn't. Um, I'm not sure if I understand the question, but continuous change. So yeah, I, I think I don't understand the question, I'm sorry. Do you, Olaf, do you have a yeah, idea. Change. Yeah, maybe the person who posted it can can detail it. Uh, or maybe we can discuss it later during the during the discussion, the third discussion session. Um, hmm. All right, there is someone here. So there is a new question. 
uh, the question says, for some reason, we expect the picture to rotate in one direction, but then because it doesn't rotate at all, we see it rotating in the other direction. Um, that's interesting. That's very interesting. <laughs> uh, so I cannot say for sure, but one interesting thing that happens with PredNet is that if, uh, so if you give it an illusion for 20 frames and you compare, so you continuously give it the, the image, the input, and you look at the output and you compare the output with the input, you will get a certain direction. For example, let's say clockwise. But if you compare, if you stop giving it the inputs and you let it run on itself and just predict and predict and predict, if you compare two predictions, now you will see motion vectors that are counterclockwise. So there is something happening. I'm not quite sure what, but um, yeah, it's possible that in the, your question basically means, do we perceive our own expect, expectations or do we perceive the violation of our expectations? I don't know. That's a good question. Okay. Um, I think that was the last question for now, at least. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much, Lena, for, for joining us. Um, uh, so that was, uh, yeah, that was a uh, really fun and uh, I hope we can uh, talk again about topics like exactly like this one. I see that uh, other people are po posting questions. So uh, I suggest that uh, right after this, we can uh, uh, all have a chat uh, over Zoom. I'll post the link again. Um, if you haven't subscribed and you want updates uh, about our talks and events, um, you can uh, just hit the subscribe button and you'll receive notifications. And then um, uh, that also helps us because we have a very hard URL to, to memorize. So uh, that will, if we get a, a, a few more uh, likes and subscri subscription on the, our YouTube channel, that will help. And uh, yeah, uh, we can also, you can also uh, um, go on uh, crosslabs.org, uh, our website, and get more information on these same uh, events and act uh, yeah, activities, workshops, and so on. OK. Uh, Thank you, we'll everyone, close. for the reactions. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, thanks again, Lana. And uh, see everyone uh, next month. I'll announce uh, uh, yeah, uh, the, the mystery talk uh, very soon. It will be probably about uh, evolution or related. Or see you in one minute in Zoom. <laughs> What's that? I'd say, or see you in one minute in Zoom. Yeah, and see you. Uh, yeah, see you very <laughs> soon in one minute in Zoom. I'll post the <laughs> I'll post the link right in the chat in a second. Bye, everyone. And let's actually.